So thanks for the invitation. I'm gonna share a bioacoustics effort recently started in Yellowstone National Park called the Cry Wolf Project. It builds on 29 years of wild wolf research in the greater Yellowstone since their reintroduction in 1995 after being exterminated in the 20s. A couple of weeks ago, a few of us were skiing in the backcountry of Yellowstone to put out some non-invasive acoustic recorders at a wolf den site, which is up on the bank there. And the females have probably whelp now or are about to whelp. There might be a female with pups in that den right now. And the thermally active earth at this particular location makes it a little warmer for the pups. And no doubt one of the reasons this pack continually returns to this den site. <clears throat> um, it, it's a really special place. I mean, it's Mars-like in appearance uh, when you're out there. So I'm going to play a recent audio clip from a female wolf called 907F, one of the longest living and the most prolific female wolves in Yellowstone, who has one functioning eye. When she made this howl, she was separated from the rest of her pack, and an hour earlier, elk had just come running by the recorder with wolves chasing them, and this is what they sounded like. <laughs> So the fundamental frequency of an average wolf howl is 350 hertz. Okay, that's middle F on your piano keyboard. 907F is a little bigger than most. She's 110 pounds for a female and she, her fundamental frequency is at 320 hertz. And I can pick her out in a crowd when I hear her outside. Okay. Okay, there's 907F, the one-eyed wonder. So an infrared image and you can see her one eye. So here are just a few of our objectives. So we're coupling recordings with camera traps plus caller data, plus field observations, plus <laughs> genetics, plus engaged citizens. Yellowstone has all of those. We're building a better camera plus audio trap. The biologists need it. We believe in haystacks, we believe in big data, but we fundamentally believe in context. We're using bioacoustics as a low cost population and presence modeling tool. Uh, we're interested in what's a wolf word or a phoneme for that matter. The holy grail, any sort of combinatorial meaning, two slot syntax, the evolution of canid language from wolves to dogs with humans in between. And then of course, carnivore conservation, let's do a better job of translating wolfish for people, livestock and wolves. So here's our study area, both inside the park where they are protected and outside of the park uh, where they can be hunted, where I live in Montana, September through March. The polygons represent various pack territories. The push pins are just some of the recorders we have out, space to pick up wolf vocalizations, which can travel six to eight kilometers, depending upon the environmental commit conditions. <laughs> there's the Rescue Creek pack territory, and there's 907F's pack territory. Okay, so the lack of rugged, uh, and I'm talking as a tech person for a second here, the lack of rugged, power efficient, vertically integrated monitoring hardware and software that scales is a serious shortcoming in terrestrial wildlife ecology and management. So we end up having to build our own, right? Integrated devices like this one that record localizable audio, I can pinpoint the location for six months on battery life and also record video, in this case, using an AI-based thermal smart trigger. Now, outside of the park, we use these devices to detect wolves <laughs> and then test playbacks of low-frequency howls and guard dog barks to see what level of wolf deterrence we can have in livestock conflict scenarios. Uh, here's what we've accomplished in the last six months. If we get our matching funds, we'll continue the research for three years. Now, it's important to note that there's 1,500 hours of actual eyeballs looking at wolves on a landscape, a wild landscape, which we then couple with the nearest audio recorders uh, to do analysis. This is a false color spectrogram of sounds made at one of the recorders for the entire month of last August. Each horizontal row uh, corresponds to a day of sound, uh, with left being midnight. And there are 31 rows for the month. So you can actually see the dawn chorus shift to the right every day as you move down in the month. And here are in the circles are just wolf chorus howls and wolves talk more at night 
until the breeding season in winter when they increase their daytime vocalizations. And aside from these chorus howls, you're seeing wolves make over <laughs> 20 call types, howls, barks, whelps, whimpers, whines, moans, blows, and even teeth clacking. Uh, wolves are cooperative breeders. They live in kin structured social groups with inbreeding avoidance, and they're primarily monogamous. And they are one of a few species who collectively communicate in a group vocalization using role-based linguistic units. They're, we think they're a great study subject for animal communication or social animal communication. Inside the park, the number one mortality of wolves is other wolves. And this is a photo of the Rescue Creek pack on the riverbank who had trapped a rival member from the Junction Butte pack, 907s, uh, after it crossed into their territory. And so we're interested in wolf communication on those boundaries of uh, other packs. Now, the number one cause of death outside the park is human, uh, typically trapping or shooting, and it's often a politicized topic, and it's back in the press again if you're following the Colorado reintroduction, as well as the Wyoming man last month who ran down a wolf on a snowmobile, which is legal there, and then duct taped her mouth and paraded her in the local bar before killing her and was fined $250 for possession of a wild live animal. That was the law. So do wolves change their vocal strategies when around humans? And how would that influence our population estimates on bioacoustics? Of course, wolves are no spring chickens and they kill too. And in Yellowstone elk are their primary diet and those carcasses draw in ravens and grizzly bears and all sorts of interspecies interactions. In particular, we have fun um, listening to how ravens vocalize in wolf context. They make a particular call that's <clears throat> It's like, sorry about that. It's like this scream <laughs> call and it indicates fresh meat has been found. And so you'll hear that often in a wolf kill site. Now, this is not suck up. I didn't know David was talking. <laughs> so I have to mention, you know, your and Martin's paper in the evolution of language, which outlined the math, right? And common, combining smaller units to get past the linguistic air limit. And he didn't mention it's really elegant, it's convincing, and thankfully short. Like you can read this at break uh, and get the point. And I think it is the $60 million question in the room actually. But the opening sentence reads, and you didn't read the opening sentence, language remains in the minds of many philosophers, linguists, and biologists, a quintessentially human trait. Now, whether or not non-human primates, chickadees, sperm whales, prairie dogs, or wolves leverage linguistic recursion, uh, remains to be seen. But we have found wolves, what's interesting, we found wolves use multiple strategies to like push the boundary of the linguistic error limit, including repetition, uh, sound duration, frequency modulation, gestures, and what I think are possibly foreknown examples of what is at least compositional meaning. I'm trying to keep up here. Uh, here are spectrograms of 50 different types of just the wolf howl, right? Perhaps arguably one of the most iconic sounds in nature. And while some researchers claim there are different semantic functions for a few of these, no one's quantified or proven their existence with playback experiments and for 100 studies or fMRI, and no one's putting a wolf in one of those anytime soon. Um, let's see if we can hear this. And here's the chorus howl response from its pack mates. The chorus howls are roughly a two minute coordinated communication event with a minimum of three different call types. I'll play just a snippet. And we're seeing that three out of four days on average have a chorus howl before the quarter. And it raises lots of questions. Do, wolves, do specific wolves kick off the chorus howl? 
Can we count the number of wolves or is it computationally unlikely? And do they leverage that? Do pups learn the probabilities of their phonetic repertoire from these social chorus howls? Someone keep reminding me to stay in sync. Um, so to get there, first we're working on a more rigorous definition of what is a wolf phoneme or syllable. And, you know, the Tweety bit work, George um, and Gesper's here, at Adversarial Gans, that's some of the stuff we're just starting right now. So this collaboration matters to us. Uh, now what's interesting at birth, wolf pups produce whimpers and whines and within a month they're already howling. But we found some evidence that wolves appear to practice their speech production, their phonemes, as they mature. In the case of this 3D spectrogram playback of a juvenile wolf experiencing difficulty with register transitions, or passaggio, if you're a human speaker, and Peter can explain that later. Starts to howl, right, coming up here. Can't get above frequency, but continues and does it again. Now we're wondering if wolves try to improve their pitch modulation control so as to signal fitness as they move into breeding season, right? It's a way to show that they're experts. Second, we're working on a more rigorous definition of wolf lexemes or words. And this recent paper from Boros and others using N400 analysis of dogs is at least a testable approach to finding lexemes. And whether you agree or not with it, it ends with a pretty bold claim, quote, this study identifies a dog event related potential component that reflects semantic expectation, thus providing the first neural evidence for object word understanding in a non-human species. Now, if you know the lexemes, you can start looking for phrases and uh, We've validated what we think are four examples of two slot syntax, whereby wolves combine two separate words into a phrase to produce some sort of combinatorial meaning. This one is called a bar cow from a wolf reacting to a different pack that had just tried to kill her. I've heard wolves make this call in the variation of it. It's interestingly similar to Suzuki and others' research in Japanese tits, where the ABC syllables equal alarm and the D syllables equal recruitment. And when the birds combine them together, they indicate a call to arms or a mob the predator. And it also reminds me of the linguist Provosh and her work on humans' two word swearing combinations as a proto language. And that gets back to Khan's statement it, looking for these linguistic fossils in humans to go back to, let's assume for a second, they don't have recursion. What are those hints to see what they are doing with their language? <clears throat> There's the spectrogram for that howl. Okay, we're interested in the discourse, as I call it, or the latent space. Uh, that's the third thing we're looking at. And we wanna understand what that looks like as best we can. I've seen no evidence of any large latent space of wolfish embeddings. Um, and if they only have a small set of linguistic embeddings, not to mention an ability to link to do recursion, what are the limitations of that latent space? Limitation is a loaded term. And how does it function neurologically? And how would we translate into those latent spaces that they have? <clears throat> this is a UMAP 3D plot from just wolf barks that we have. Uh, it's been very for helpful for finding phonetic outliers that would then we tie back and look for semantic correlates in our field observations. But ultimately, I am most interested in the question of what do wolves use their language for in context, in situ, whether it's gestural, scent, or vocal. And this video caught our attention. Um, you're gonna see a tail tuck submissive male walk by the screen with a dominant male whimpering as it follows, and an alpha female down there in the bottom left, and this all happens in breeding season. So I gotta start these at the same time. Okay, so there's the sub, classic, you know, posture. Okay. That's not the wolf whimpering. The wolf whimpering is right here. Classic dominance posture. Look at this. Here's the 
You're not supposed to whimper at a subdominant male. The female's laying right there. We think he's whimpering at the female. So wolf whimpers, if we use Kat's phrase of timeless meaning, in the sense that the wolf whimper is like this begging or longing for something. Uh, but in this case, the wolf's holding two things in its mind, communicating two things at the same time, and everybody knows the context. And it's like, you know, being in a bar and you flip off someone you're mad at, or you do chin flick, and then you use a pickup line uh, for someone at the bar at the same time, right? It's kind of like what I'm trying to do right here. So in closing, you know, you all likely probably remember this album, right? Massive impact on whale conservation in 1970 by Roger and Katie Payne. You probably don't remember this one, 1971, narrated by Robert Redford, produced by Columbia Records, partly due to the Natural History Museum in New York. Um, and last year, we decided to do this because what wasn't in Yellowstone in 1971? Wolves. So we did this for the public um, as a reminder to the visitors there of what it means to live in a natural predator prey ecosystem. And I don't have time to explain this image, but if you've ever watched my second favorite movie, <laughs> Arrival, you'll know what I mean when I say thank you, Inter uh, Species Internet and Santa Fe Institute for bringing the coffee this week. <laughs> and what a privilege to be here. And thanks to Professor Joanna Lambert and Dr. Dan Staler and his entire Yellowstone Wolf Project team. Thank you. Ben, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the question I had uh, regards the um, instruments that are being used to capture sound, for example, are they recording and then you have to physically go and capture or are they transmitting data? I guess if they were transmitting, you wouldn't get six months of battery life, but just to, uh, to confirm with you, it's a local recording, is that correct? Yeah, yep. And what, the reason we want longer battery life is when we put them at den sites, we're not disrupting. We're, we do not go back in there. But yeah, yeah it, as Very... soon as we started transmitting over LTE or anything, we'd be down to four days of battery. Okay. Well, we may, we, we may have some answers to that, but I'll put that down as a uh, something to pursue. Long battery life and still ability to uh, capture data. Do the different packs have different dialects? Yeah, it depends on your definition of dialect. Uh, let's go even broader than that. Like the Mexican grays down here uh, in this area and the gray wolf, right? I'm not a big splitter, more of a lumper than a splitter, but um, hi hi generally a higher frequency down here. And Julie and I were talking about this. It could it be environmental um, as to why you transfer? Uh, Rick McIntyre, if you've ever heard of him, he always asked me, like, do they have a Boston accent? Like, can you get a wolf moving into another pack and they'll learn that behavior? The honest truth is wolves are really hard to study in the wild bioacoustically, which is why we take the approach we do. And, and I think that audio clip of the wolf trying, you know, to do that frequency shift, when I finally, that caught my, I'm like, holy cow. Right? Mm -hmm. If there is some learning, progression of learning, then you're going to possibly have that. Mm -hmm. Lots, you know, the only studies on wolves that say, yeah, we can ID them. Um, I'm like, okay, yeah, I think that's just common sense that they can ID each other. You'd have to disprove that. Uh, and then the question is, the big question for us is, do they have dialects in their pack when mm -hmm. they do the chorus help? And does another pack hear it? Do you transfer any information between them? Tons of questions. I don't have a whole lot of answers. See, we're up to, let's go into the break. We're a little bit over. So a 15 minute break and we'll rejoin at 11. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>